So, um, very happy to be here today. I don't usually get a chance to talk to too many people like this. This is a fantastic audience. Uh, also a very attractive audience, with a few exceptions out there, I see. Um, my name is Alan Bentley, and I get to work with innovations coming out of Vanderbilt University. In fact, my middle name is Innovation. I actually literally changed it to Innovation about four years ago to show dedication to my, to my craft. Uh, I work at Vanderbilt University. Vanderbilt is, I guess I'm going to challenge the people in the back here uh, to, to, keep up, to keep up with me. They, um, Vanderbilt University is the only private institution in the SEC, so I guess that means we don't care squat about economic development. Uh, I don't think that's actually true. We care very much about it. Um, you know, I, I thought we had some great presentations. I'm going to give you a little bit of a different presentation. I presume that everybody here knows or has heard of technology transfer, knows a little bit about it. But I also presume that everyone doesn't know a lot of the details about technology transfer, so we're going to get into that a little bit. Uh, also, since we're way ahead of time, I thought I was going to have to rush through my slides, so I've been told to take the entire rest of the time. So you had me for an hour and ten minutes. So I hope everyone's comfortable. Okay, so uh, I'm going to cover, oh, here, down here, I'm going to cover three uh, basic topics, uh, overview of tech transfer and some of the challenges in, uh, associated with, with technology transfer, and then uh, give you a unique perspective on a, a particular uh, public-private partnership that we've entered into. Starting with the overview of tech transfer, um, I'm going to, in the spirit of the SEC, pay no attention to this slide. I don't know how to go back or I would. Um, I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to call an audible. So it's something that SEC fans know a lot about. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of tech transfer. I don't know why I'm inspired by this. I was sitting here listening to these good presentations, and all I could think about was how hungry I was. But then that reminded me, uh, especially with the Beyond Food presentation. I, I like that one. But um, I'm going to go back. Um, about 80 years or 90 years. So I have a question for the audience. Um, you guys are all well-educated, intelligent people. Someone surely can tell me, how do they get the vitamin D milk in the, in the milk? How do they get the vitamin D in the milk? Sorry. Just yell out the answer. Really? Come on, someone has to know. So, OK, you guys are all real shy. I know you haven't, you haven't met each other yet. Yeah. OK. So back in the... Um, Back in the early 1900s at the University of Wisconsin, there was a professor, Harry Steenbach, that was doing research on trying to cure rickets in children. And he realized that, there, that it was basically caused by a vitamin D deficiency. And this is part of me wasting a little bit of extra time, by the way. So caused by a vitamin D uh, deficiency. So he was um, doing some research and figured out that if you run milk and other food products, um, <clears throat> if you expose it to a certain level of radiation, a certain type of radiation, a chemical reaction occurs and vitamin D is produced in that, in that product. And it was basically used for milk and he patented that. And in fact, the University of Wisconsin didn't have a mechanism back in around 1916, 1917 to protect ideas of that nature. Uh, they really weren't into the patenting and licensing um, activities. And so uh, Harry got, uh, with the help of some alumni, got together a group of people that invested a very small amount of money and created an associated organization called the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, WARF for short if you've heard of it. And he put the technology into this foundation. And this foundation was responsible for the commercialization of the idea of vitamin D food products, in particular milk. And they licensed that technology out and over the lifetime of the patent, they earned over a billion dollars uh, on the technology. So um, Steve mentioned, asked the question, are there any universities that don't have, uh, that, that have too much money? Uh, no one raised their hand, but there are a few. Um, Worf may be one of them. So a billion dollars back in 1925 is a, is a lot more than, yeah, than it is today as well. So that was one of the first examples of a true life-changing innovation coming out of academic research. And there are many other examples as well, and we'll actually touch upon a few today. Uh, nevertheless, throughout, from that time period, a few institutions tried to uh, emulate that model of coming up with an idea, protecting the idea with a patent, and trying to commercialize the idea in some way. But um, those types of activities were very few and far between. Most people felt that commercializing academic technology really kind of got your hands dirty. You know, making money off of your ideas got your hands dirty in academia, and there wasn't a lot of, a lot of support for that. Well, um, as a result of that, universities continue to do what they do well, and that is publish on their technologies and get research money, get federal dollars and such. And other countries, in particular the, the Japanese, not to single them out in particular, but um, a lot of countries were reading these publications and implementing and utilizing the teachings of those into products and competing with the U.S. companies. Uh, back in 1975, um, 
Does anybody know what the largest television manufacturer was in the world? Exactly. No, I didn't hear it, but it's RCA. Uh, the, uh, up until about five years ago, all American television companies were wiped out because they were technologically inferior to um, other countries. And so you've seen this in different industries, the degradation of, US in, uh, of, of companies in certain U.S. industries. And so back around 1980, uh, Birch Bayh and Bob Dole uh, co-sponsored a bill called the Bayh-Dole Act. And the Bayh-Dole Act changed, this, uh, changed the, the, the playing field. It basically changed the laws to say that if you use federal dollars to invent something in a university, it used to be the government owned that, and you'd have to give it to the government, and they wouldn't do much with it. Now, as of 1980, if you invent something in a university using federal dollars, you own it. The institution owns it, not the federal government, but the institution has to go and try to commercialize it. So technology transfer operations blossomed starting around circa 1980. We went from about a few dozen across the country to about 300 in the course of a decade. Uh, the technology licensing office at Vanderbilt University started in 1990. And um, so thanks to, to Birch Bayh and Bob Dole, I actually have a job today. So let's get back onto the, uh, onto the slide presentation here. I'll skip a few of these. This is fundamentally what our office does. We have three major activities. We try to take innovations that result from academic research and move them to the marketplace so they can be uh, turned into products that help society. Uh, safer cars, better materials, um, um, improved healthcare products that result in shorter stays in the hospital and reduce expenses, things of that nature. We also try to contribute to local economic growth by creating startup companies around these ideas. Sometimes we get an entrepreneur, we get an inventor involved, we try to find venture capital, and we create a company. The third thing that we actually focus a lot on is corporate partnerships, and we've heard a lot about that earlier today already. And in corporate partnerships means bringing sponsored research dollars into the university to advance our early stage technologies to make them less risky, more proven, so that they can be licensed more effectively in the future. Uh, in my particular role at Vanderbilt, uh, it's basically a three-step process. We evaluate technologies on a variety of conditions. Uh, most notably, is it patentable, is it protectable? Can we have a monopoly uh, that the intellectual property provides uh, around it? Oh, I'm sorry, hold on. Go ahead. Thank you. We, we, uh, we analyze our technologies for patentability, for market potential, and the, uh, the ability to impact society in one way or another, and also the track record of the inventor, um, are there additional resources identified to continue to develop the technology further? Those are the types of things we use to evaluate a technology. Once we've done the evaluation, we try to determine the pathway of that technology. Is that something which we should license to an existing company? Is it something that we should create a company around? Or is it something that we should try to find additional resources and develop it further so that it is more proven later and can be licensed out or, or a new company can be spun out at, at a later time? That's the incubation aspect of it. <clears throat> Once we've done that, uh, the three key outcomes of our activities are licensing of technology. So we negotiate license agreements with companies. Uh, we negotiate venture funding agreements with venture capitalists. And we assist with research and development agreements with, with, uh, with, with industry. Uh, we have a lot of goals. Around budget time, revenue generation is always a principal goal. Um, all year long, faculty services is an important goal for us as well. But you can see there are potentially conflicting uh, obligations of the office. Uh, contributing to, to local economic development. Do I create a company around a technology or do I license it to an established larger company? You know, which one is more risky? Which one can create benefits? Uh, what type of benefits are created? The financial benefits of licensing to a large company versus the job creation benefits of licensing to a startup company. That's a little too small, I, I'm, I'm afraid, but basically, um, why do we do these types of things? One thing that is not often talked about is when you have a faculty member that has a first relationship with, a, with a, an industry, um, a commercial partner, scientists and industry, once that uh, relationship runs its course, that faculty member is much more intelligent and much more knowledgeable than he or she was before that relationship. It really changes the mind of a faculty member to have those types of industry academic relationships. It's very good for them, very good for their long term, um, you know, for their careers. Uh, licensing technologies definitely uh, generates revenue that can be plowed back into supporting additional research. It does uh, help us with branding and such. Everyone knows Gatorade has come from Florida, things of that nature. Uh, it also uh, creates opportunities for retention and uh, recruitment of faculty. So there's a lot of reasons to be in the commercialization uh, foray. 
So I don't know if you can appreciate this. We all did our slides very late, I'm sure. At least I know I did mine. But do you have any idea how long it took to color each of these stupid words and to make them do the things that they did? It took about three and a half hours. If I could figure it out, I would play it again. Okay, there we go. And uh, I just want to say that uh, universities contribute substantially to a number of different types of products and services that we see nowadays. There are a few on this. I have vit vitamin D milk on here, of course. But also, I mentioned Gatorade already. Um, also, what is on here? Uh, Remicade came from the University of Georgia. Um, Intriva came from Emory University. I thought we'd include that because they were local. Uh, I even had to put Taxol on here, even though I really despise Florida State as an ACC team. But in any event, um, there are about 156 drugs on the market right now that came out of academic laboratories. So the, the benefit of supporting academic research is clear. I'm going to pause in this slide just for a minute. And I should have put on here somewhere that these are 2014 fiscal year numbers. This is an important slide to digest. Uh, this says that there are nearly 5,500 licenses executed out of universities in the United States to companies every year. And on top of that 5,435, there's another 1,200 options, which means a right to license in the future as soon as you develop it over, over a year or two, or two of time. So we're getting around 6,000, 6,500 licenses every year from academia to industry. Of those, 914 startups were created last year from US, uh, out of US universities alone. Of those 914, on the right-hand side, 702 were local to their institution. So that's talk, you want to talk about creating economic development, I think that's it. That's more than half. I'm not a mathematician, but I think it's more than half. It's actually, it's more than three quarters. Come on, guys, wake up. Um, in addition to that, $28 billion were created uh, on sales of products. In 2014 alone, this isn't cumulative, this is in 2014 alone, the products came out of universities, generated $28 billion in sales. Talk about a tremendous revenue generator. That is why The Economist called the Bayh-Dole Act the most inspiring piece of legislation in the second half of the 20th century, because it creates tens of thousands of jobs, it creates billions of dollars in um, economic value for, for the United States. So the impact here is incontrovertible. Just last year alone, 965 new products came on the marketplace that originated from academia. Now keep in mind, the 914, or, or sorry, the 5,500 that were licensed are not the same ones that were coming on the market because it takes a number of years for a product to be licensed, developed, uh, maybe it goes to regulatory approval, those types of things, and ends up being uh, commercialized. So there's a time difference be between those two numbers, but 965 products, almost 1,000 products, new products every year coming out of academic ideas is actually quite impressive, at least it is to me. There are some universities that make a boatload of money. The top 10 universities make more than half of all the money in tech transfer. It's a game of home runs. Um, Northwestern Lyrica, $192 million in 2013 for one drug. That's their royalty off the sales of that particular drug. It can be rather staggering. Uh, Princeton University, if Princeton University is making so much money now off of, off of a drug that was just approved about four years ago that there are citizens in the city of Princeton that are suing them to challenge their not-for-profit status. Now, that would not be too bad of a problem to have, frankly. Uh, we don't have that at Vanderbilt, but you know, we're, we're trying to create that problem. That's the upside of, of commercialization. There are some downsides, and we've touched on this already. Technology is a very early stage. They're unproven. Um, they're very risky. It's hard to invest in them if you're on the corporate sector. Uh, sometimes they're very similar to other technologies. They don't, not, they don't differentiate. Uh, sometimes they're in areas where there is a lot of other technology. So there's a, lot of, there's a, dominate, a domination effect. Sometimes they are interesting concepts, but there's just not a real product around them. And so there are a lot of, a lot of tr challenges. So to give you a sense of it, 15% of technologies that we receive in academia, and this is across the US, not, not at Vanderbilt, 15% uh, of technologies disclosed uh, get licensed out. So if you know the reference, we're below the Mendoza line in terms of success on that. And that's because of all the challenges and complexities of the, of the early stage nature of the technologies that, that, we, that we get to work with. Of those that are licensed out, less than half of them generate any licensing revenue at all. Less than half generate a dollar of licensing revenue. Of the ones that do, only five or 10% generate a substantial amount of money. So you're getting down to around 1% or so of the technologies that you see will actually have a tremendous impact financially. And so it, it's, a, it's a difficult business to be in. 
but there are some fantastic successes as well. So a conclusion is it's dangerous to rely on academic uh, tech transfer to fill any budget gaps um, or research support gaps uh, in your budget because uh, you, you, you can't really, you can't rely on it. You know, the odds are too low. And when I license a technology, it usually takes a decade for me to get any substantial revenues back because it takes that long for the companies to take it on, develop it into a product, test it, market it, and, and sell it, and start to gain traction in the marketplace. It takes a very long time. 12 or more years for a drug, uh, maybe less than half that for a medical device, engineering technologies, it's all over the map in terms of how long it takes to make it to the marketplace. So moving along, um, you know, it, it behooves us to try to find unique and different partnerships to try to get technologies out there, get as many technologies out in the marketplace as possible. And I'm gonna talk about one. One is the creation of this uh, entity called Cumberland Emerging Technologies. About 12 years ago, we entered into a partnership uh, with Cumberland Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, which is the only public pharmaceutical company in the state of Tennessee. It's not a big one, but it is a public company in Tennessee. The, uh, the state entity, the, te the Tennessee Technology Development Corporation, also called TTDC, now, if you follow this, it's called Launch Tennessee. They changed their name, they rebranded. And Vanderbilt University all got together and created a, um, a company. It, is, it actually is a company. We're all stakeholders in this company. All, we're all equity holders. And their purpose is to, I probably can't read that, it's to bridge, I'll, I'll read it right off of their website, to bridge the development gap and bring biomedical technologies from research and development laboratories to the marketplace. So take ideas and bring it to the marketplace. How did they go about doing that? Well, there's two major mechanisms. What they do is they help us write SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research Grants, SBIR and STTR grants. Um, you probably have heard of those grants, but if you haven't, they're federal grants. Every agency has a small piece of their budget dedicated to these types of grants, which, which um, they give grants to small companies, and CET is that small company that receives the grant, they're the grant holder, um, to develop early stage concepts. And you almost always have to have, you don't have to, but you almost always have a university partner in that. And Vanderbilt or other universities can be that partner. So they're very good at grant writing. They're very good at R&D uh, contributions. So they have scientists, they have laboratories, they have resources, they make investments in technologies coming out of the universities, and they bring those things on and they try to get federal dollars. When, when CET gets a grant, uh, their partner, where Vanderbilt's a partner on about half of their, uh, half of their grants, their partner gets a subcontract, so it brings research dollars into the university dedicated to developing that technology further, moving it farther along its development pathway. They also have an incubator where new companies are spun out of, out of these ideas. They come out of the university, we put the technology in, um, and uh, CET can provide them with, with a place to develop. So this is a list of um, partnerships. So Vanderbilt's one of the partners of CET. Uh, the University of Tennessee, both in Knoxville and the Health Sciences Center um, in, uh, in Memphis are partners, so they have contracts with CET. Washington University in St. Louis and Old Miss. And now, I, I don't really follow football at all, but I heard something about Old Miss having a good year and having some type of a signature win. So uh, good for them if that's true. Uh, in any event, you can see this is not something which is exclusive to Vanderbilt. So Vanderbilt actually may make money one day if we could ever sell our stock in CET, which it's not liquid, so we can't. But this is a program that's open to any institution. And if you want to talk and find out a little bit more about CET, we're certainly happy to do that, and we can connect you to them. This is just a very uninteresting picture of their incubator. They have 14,000 square foot of space in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, home of the Tennessee Titans, by the way. I'm taping the game, so please don't tell me what the score is if you catch me after this. Uh, they have six current tenants, and they've graduated nine other tenants. So there is a place to go and to grow uh, if you're working with CET. They have filed to date, and by the way, even though they're 12 years old, they really didn't kind of do too much for the first four or five years. It was a kind of a very long, protracted development, early, early, early stage development of the organization. They filed 44 SBIRs, phase one and phase two. Phase one grants are usually in the neighborhood of $100,000, pretty small. Phase two grants come after phase one and they could be up to a million dollars, so they could be much more substantial. They've received nine awards, which is about a 20% uh, funding rate, which is um, a, a, quite a bit better than you know, what you get for the typical R01 grant, which is somewhere around 12% if I remember correctly. There are four grant applications in process right now, two for phase one and two for phase uh, two. And we, Vanderbilt, has actually just signed 
four agreements over the last three months with CET for some new projects coming out. And the really cool thing about CET that we like, that is unique, is that we don't necessarily have to have a very strong proprietary IP position in order to work with them. Uh, as long as we can develop a business case, even though there isn't that patent there that is the anchor, they'll still take on those projects. So they'll take on projects that we really haven't um, been able to get traction for elsewhere. So that's a very attractive thing. I'm gonna jump back real quick to this slide and just say just for a moment, what does everybody get out of this? What does Cumberland Pharmaceuticals get out of making, putting money into this subsidiary company? Not only, they, not only did they make an investment, they actually provided scientists, regulatory assistance, and all those types of things to make this program uh, successful. It is in the biomedical space, certainly, uh, but basically, if a new product comes through this pipeline, through CET, Cumberland doesn't really have a legal first right of refusal or first right of access, but they would be the obvious group to negotiate, and that's kind of what they get as a first look at technologies. So they are looking to develop a pipeline, and a certain portion of the technology is going through CET for development will end up going to Cumberland. Uh, Vanderbilt, they get what I just told you. Basically, we get access to a new uh, um, a way of getting technologies out there that we, that we didn't have access to before. We have third parties putting money into our technologies. We have people trying to fight for grants that bring money into our laboratories. We have much better faculty engagement, so the faculty know, many of the faculty know about this program and are interested in it. Uh, it's been very good for us, and the Tennessee Technology Development Corporation obviously gets the benefit of new jobs created because of some portion of the, of the technology spent on the new companies, and a number of them are staying local in, in their incubator. So I think that's about it, but that's been a very interesting partnership for us because principally private institutions um, have difficulty sometimes finding ways of working with their state, their state legislature. It's not easy to find ways of working together, especially when resources are involved. And this has been one very successful thing on a very modest scale uh, for Vanderbilt and the state uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. We did bring one product through this early on, and now it's in phase two clinical trials. We have another product that we are filing for an IND for uh, clinical development uh, in about two weeks and two other products that are in late stage preclinical development that we hope to take into the clinic within the next year. So it has some real tangible outcomes. I basically covered that, so I think I'll stop now. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them. If not, I thank you for your time. Questions, questions?